everybody. I'm so glad all you guys made it. Uh, let's start with Startup Grind. Startup Grind is a uh, community of over 2,500 members. Uh, we are now one of the leading startup event networks in Dubai. Startup Grind is a global startup community designed to educate, inspire, and connect entrepreneurs. We host monthly events in more than 185 cities for a network of 200,000 entrepreneurs featuring successful local founders, innovators, in, uh, educators, and investors who share personal stories and lessons learned on the road to building great companies. Our monthly fireside chat interviews, startup mixers, and annual conferences provide ample opportunities to connect with amazing startups and the people behind them. Tap into a strong support network for meaningful connections and gain inspiration for the startup journey ahead. Uh, my name is Gabriela. I'm the co-founder of Partimo Jobs. I'm also a, a senior at Middlesex University of Life. Uh, now, me, now we're going to Ayman Kafi. I'm going to tell you a bit about him. Uh, Ayman Kafi is the managing director of Startup Central UAE, the online community portal which brings all entrepreneurs, mentors, investors, and supporters in one place for connection and collaboration. Ayman is currently based in Dubai. It's his fourth year here and is passionate about enabling and supporting the entrepreneurship culture here and thus created this not-for-profit platform to the benefit of the UAE startup system. Ayman is also a serial entrepreneur and investor himself, having founded and backed several tech startups in the region and hold talks and mentorship sessions at various hackathon, entrepreneurship workshops and SME conferences. Some of his other ventures include the career consulting and job placement platform, Dubai Job Connections, and the business networking mobile app called Launchmaster. Originally from Saudi Arabia, Ayman holds an MBA in strategic management from Texas and has held senior HR management roles in his corporate career prior to taking the entrepreneurial path. He worked with such large MSPs such as Unilever, the IMF, and Emirates Airlines. Okay, so let's start with the first question. So, Ayman, um, you've been in the U.S. before you studied there. So why did you choose Dubai out of all places to start your, uh, to launch your startup? Because everyone wants to launch their startup in the Silicon Valley or just in the U.S. Okay, um, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. So, uh, yes, basically I had already moved to uh, Dubai during my corporate as you just mentioned, my last corporate job was with Emirates Airlines. Yes. So that brought me here to Dubai. <coughs> and then I was already here, and I saw how the entrepreneurship ecosystem is, was starting to grow here, and uh, a lot of startups were coming out of this region. So I chose to, to continue being uh, based here and to explore my uh, entrepreneurship uh, activities uh, here in the world. And uh, are you looking into going to Silicon Valley after this, after Dubai? Could be. I mean, um, Projects that go into Silicon Valley, they have to be ready for Silicon Valley. So if something grows to a certain level where it's going to be global, it's going to be able to compete on a global scale, then perhaps, uh, yes. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, Silicon Valley is no place for, for, for small things that aren't, that aren't uh, world class yeah. yet. You know? So at some point, at some stage, sure. And you work for such big MNCs such as Unilever, MNC, and IMF. Why did you get up, up all that security for your startups? I mean, that's a big risk. How did you do that? Okay. Well, actually, I have an interesting answer for that because okay. um, as an entrepreneur, I believe that um, having a corporate job is not the place of security. This is more the place of security because when you manage your own business and you're in control of your own activities and, and you have your own profit and loss, you, you have a, a more sense of security than if you're just uh, working for a company where you don't control with these variables. Because in, in, in a lot of cases you can see when there's an economic downturn, mm -hmm. people can end up losing their jobs or you know markets can change and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's happening now in the world in, in different places. Mm -hmm. So usually when um, owning your own assets and, and, and being involved with your own businesses, that you know that's that has provides you with better security than uh, than the you know traditional corporate jobs. But but going back to your question, I mean uh, Entrepreneurship is a calling, right? Yeah. Uh, I've been in corporate corporate world for about 13 years, um, and eventually, you know, you get tired of the fact that uh, in big companies there's a lot of bureaucracy, there's a lot of internal politics. Um, you have to keep 
you know, climbing the ladder and playing that kind of game, you know, in, inside the company. And uh, at a certain point, very large companies get a little tiresome, and you you have a longing for a more smaller, you know, environment and one where you have a more active role to play in. So that was kind of the transition that I went through eventually, and you know, decided to uh, focus more on smaller ventures. Okay. So let's go further now. Now we're going to startup central. Um, why did you? Startup Central, where are you going with this? Okay. So Startup Central, as you mentioned a moment ago, uh, it's been created as a platform, an online community for entrepreneurs and anyone involved in the startup ecosystem, especially in the UAE, because we're focusing with this on, on the UAE. So what I mean by ecosystem is anyone involved uh, at all. It could be someone who just has an idea, who's an aspiring entrepreneur, and they, they want to check if this idea is going to be worth something, they want to validate it, they want to share it with people. Uh, and it could be someone who's already founded uh, a startup, maybe they're founding several. It could be uh, a successful entrepreneur who wants to mentor others or wants to be involved with, with others, with the new generation. Uh, we have business experts who, who join the platform, investors, um, and also even service providers who provide supplementary services to the startups. So this is the ecosystem, and without, I mean, the, the ecosystem has to be brought together in one place, it has to be cohesive. Without that, it can't really function that well. And without each part of the of the ecosystem having easy access to the others, you know, uh, it won't function very very efficiently. So if you look at, for example, if you're a, let's say a co-founder, and you, you if you're a founder and you want to look for a co-founder to run to help you with your project, or if you're an investor looking to invest in a project, or if you're a mentor looking to be paired up with, with someone to to mentor, um, if you if you're looking for let's say you're not a technology person but you want to create a startup, you need a technology person to help you or you need to get that service from someone. So this is the aim of Startup Central, to bring all that together in one place, to help enable the, the local ecosystem, to, to help anyone be able to, okay, I have an idea, this is the, these are the, the resources, all the resources in one place that I need in order to bring my idea into reality. So that was the idea behind the Startup Central. Okay, and you have more than one uh, startup, you also have launch masters and other job connections for them. How do you keep focused? Because it's really difficult to keep focused on one startup. How do you have more than one? How, how do you manage that? Well, I mean, not all of these are my personal startups. Uh, I am a partner in, in some other startups where they're being run by, by, by other teams as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm just you know, one of the partners and I offer, uh, I offer advice, I offer help. Uh, I work on them a little bit when the time, when, when time calls. Um, and some of these things are a bit kind of, um, I would say, sort of seasonal. For example, you mentioned earlier that one of, one of the uh, businesses I have is a recruitment business. Mm -hmm. That's rather seasonal because, for example, during the summertime, yeah. nothing really happens in terms of that. Mm -hmm. So that kind of takes the, the, the back seat, mm -hmm. uh, and then other projects probably shine more in that period. So, you know, during the year, I mean, I allocate my time to different projects as per where it's needed. Mm -hmm. For example, the, the Lunch Matcher app, which you mentioned, it's basically mm -hmm. an app for business networking over lunchtime. Mm -hmm. Okay. Obviously, during, for example, Ramadan, this wouldn't work. <laughs> so during that month, we, we would focus on something else. We wouldn't be advertising this this one so much and this kind of thing. So there is a way you can allocate your time. So for every season, you have a different startup? Kind of. I mean, uh, sometimes even depending on certain events that are happening or things occurring, like uh, right now in Dubai, this is the season where a lot of events and, and festivals and things are happening. So according to which startup you know is, is pertinent at that time, that's what we focus on for like a week or two. But yes, it is, it is draining in, in, in the end. I mean, uh, unless you have resources to be able to have a lot of people working with you on these and helping to make things happen, there's no single person who can manage all this, uh, all this stuff at once. Okay, so you hold an MBA from uh, Texas. Mm -hmm. Did the MBA enable you, did it give you the skills to launch a startup? And would you recommend other uh, aspiring entrepreneurs to get an MBA first before starting up? I would say no, just do it. Okay. I think it does help. It doesn't make all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I think it helped me more in my corporate life because in some uh, institutions, for example, at the, let's say, in, in the IMF where I worked in, in the States, uh, they actually have different grades if you hold a different degree. Mm -hmm. So it, it does directly make a difference if, for example, if you have a, a master's degree versus bachelor's degree, they give you a different job grade, mm -hmm. by the way. So in certain institutions, it does help. In, in terms of, for startups, mm -hmm. It does, but not. I don't think every single person needs to have the MBA because I think 
in every startup, there's usually a person who's more focused on the technical side, there's a person who's focused on maybe the product side and things like that. Uh, and there should be at least one kind of business-minded person. The person who's running the, you know, the, the, the business plan, the, uh, you know, uh, outreach, the numbers, these kind of things. And I think that person should ideally hold some kind of business degree, because it does really help. I mean, it, it gives you a wide variety of business subjects in, in one place, right? So you know a little bit about finance, a little bit about marketing, a little bit about sales, management, how, how do you manage people, how do you manage resources, HR, optimization, all these things. And these are important for a startup, because you're basically a business in a box. You, you can't afford to hire 100 people to run your, your business, so you have to have the majority of the knowledge needed to run the business. You can't afford to go and get a consultant either, right? So usually, yes, at least one person should have some sort of a business education, whether an MBA or something else. And the rest of the, the co-founders could be focused on, on different areas. Right? So if you compare your 14 years of <coughs> corporate experience versus your MBA, which one is uh, able to, to start your, uh, to launch your startup? Which one is, uh, give you more skills? The 12 years, 14 years of experience or your uh, MBA? Honestly, I would say neither. The, neither. What I've learned on the ground as an entrepreneur in the last two years, that was the real education. <laughs> So honestly, I mean, I, I call this one the real MBA, because what you learn in a classroom mm -hmm. is one thing, and then it doesn't really prepare you for what happens in, in, in the real world as a business person. So uh, I've started my entrepreneurship journey in the uh, uh, beginning of 2014, so it's been a little over two years. In these last two years, I probably learned more about business than the, rest, the whole, my, whole of my life before that combined. Because when you actually try it and do it yourself, when you have to actually speak and negotiate and do things and get shut down and get rejected and all this kind of thing, that doesn't come in a classroom. And it doesn't come in the sheltering of a corporate life either. So even in my corporate life, usually when we, you know, we have meetings inside the company, of course there are internal stakeholders and things like that. But usually things aren't that bad. You know, we're all in one company and we're trying to all help each other. But here it's not. Here it's everybody wants to compete with you, everyone wants to push you away, and, and you know, you have to learn things that you didn't expect to <laughs> so let's get back to Startup Central. Your main aim is to get the people mm -hmm. closer to Dubai's entrepreneurship scene, and you're also focusing on students. And do you think that your platform can actually motivate students? Because people say, well, entrepreneurship is a calling. Do you believe that with your uh, with Startup Central, you would be able to convince more students to become entrepreneurs? Okay. Well. We can't, I guess, as you, as you said, some people are probably set in their ways in a certain way. Uh, we can't really aim to convince or change somebody's mindset completely. Though. What we aim for is make it seem so easy and so doable that people can consider it, right? So once we show people that we have all these resources together in one place and that we have kind of like, you know, um, instead of you know driving somewhere without railings, you can fall off. There are these railings that we have here. So we're here to protect you, to enable you. We're here to you know, provide you all the resources that you need in order to you know, avoid most types of failure as an entrepreneur, in order to have everything at your fingertips that you need to, to generate ideas and to take them to the market and all that. So hopefully when we present it that way, we can at least just you know, make it as a, as, a, as a viable option for people. Because traditionally, as you, as you mentioned, I mean, a lot of university graduates will go straight into, okay, there's a career fair, I want to meet companies, I want to polish my resume, I want to get a corporate job, which is fine. I mean, that's the, kind of the normal way of doing things. But now, there's an alternative to that. Because yes. markets are changing, jobs aren't always going to be available. Especially for fresh graduates, you know, um, fresh graduates are having, I guess, a bit less of a possibility of getting a big job by a, a university. So, the alternative to that would be that you explore other paths, okay? So, if you don't want to get a corporate job, there's two main other paths that you can follow. One is you can become an entrepreneur to consider starting your own business or partnering with people to do that. The other one would be if you have some sort of talent. For example, you, you can get into sports, you can get into you know, you know, arts or anything like that. So we want to present entrepreneurship as a viable option instead of being a black hole. Okay, I want to be an entrepreneur, but what do I do? I have this idea, what do I do with it? Who do I take it to? And who's going to help me with it and all that, right? So that's at least the problem that we try to solve here. And uh, what resources and connections did you leverage to become successful at your startups? <coughs> um, connectivity, I think, is the, is the biggest thing. I mean, if uh, for anyone who wants to start, uh, who wants to create a startup or a business, keep in mind you can't do it in isolation. 
right? We all have to help each other to grow. And any business depends on all the other businesses around it in order to grow. Because you will need services from other providers and people will need things from you in return. Uh, you will need to have good people in your business, good mindsets and all that. Uh, and you will need connections because uh, obviously the best way to get your products out there and to, to make a name in the market is through connecting and networking. So that's, I think, that's the biggest, one of the biggest things. And uh, most magazines or articles, they say you have to be an extrovert to become a successful entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Are you an extrovert or introvert? How did that help you in uh, becoming successful? Okay. I don't think I'm an extreme extrovert. I'm probably somewhere in, in the middle. And I think actually most of the successful entrepreneurs that you hear about in the US and Silicon Valley are either somewhere in, in the middle or actually even more on the introvert side. So I don't think extroversion is necessary, um, especially for the main idea person or the main founder. There needs to be at least someone on the team or on the founding team who can obviously be aggressive in taking things to the market and making the connections and all that. Uh, again, it's just like the MBA question. Not every person has to have that skill, but at least you should, prob you should prob possibly have one person on, on the team that has, uh, that has that ability. But usually, in, with introversion as well, comes a lot of other benefits. I don't know if some of you read the, the book called uh, The Quiet, right? Which talks about, oh, okay, some of you haven't heard of it. It talks about the people who are usually the quiet ones, that they, you know, they don't raise their hands a lot in, in school and all that, and they're, they're not very extroverted, they don't talk to any, everyone on the street. So basically it describes introversion, but it also describes how that can be a very powerful benefit. People like that are usually very introspective, they think a lot inside in their mind, and they produce ideas that nobody else can so I think a balance of both is needed in, in every aspect of life. So one of the top five reasons startups fail is because they uh, don't know how to find the right team, how to form the right team. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for aspiring entrepreneurs uh, how to form the right team? How did you do it when you just started up? Okay. Yes, team issues are very important. And I think that is one of the big uh, reasons why startups don't get off the ground very, uh, very well. Um, and there's really no kind of magic or easy solution for, for this. I mean, people just have to be very tenacious and very diligent in who they, uh, they choose as a, uh, a partner, a co-founder, or someone working with them. Um, it's kind of like you know choosing for your marriage or something. I mean, it's, it's a very, very big decision. You have to really assess the other person's character. You have to assess the kind of chemistry between you and how you fit together. So for example, in my case, I think the approach that I usually followed was starting with the smallest possible team and then growing it gradually as it, as it comes. So for, for some of my projects, I have just one other co-founder where you know I've met that person, they've had the same idea, and we, we've combined our ideas together and founded something, okay? And we're then becoming very cautious on who else joins the team. Because we have our own chemistry and now it's becoming more difficult to find someone who fits both, you know, both of us and, and all that. But as the, as the project grows, um, it will attract attention in the market and, and the right people hopefully will be drawn to you. So then at that stage, your team can grow. That's, that's what I would suggest. And uh, would you recommend people to start up uh, a company with their friends or not? To say, no, don't work with friends. It's, it's not good. Because I know a lot of startups, a lot of founders that work with friends and okay. it just failed after that. Okay, that's a good question. It gets debated a lot, actually. Starting businesses with friends or with family members. Right. Especially in the Middle know, East. Exactly. I heard a lot of opinions on that, actually. And I think family is definitely not recommended because you cannot risk having business come between you and your family and, and, it, and it breaks the bonds of the family or something like that. Uh, with friends, I guess it's a little bit more of a bearable risk because obviously, you know, uh, friendship, I mean, uh, people, people move, people grow, friendships come and go. It's a, at least it's a risk that you can accept more than with your family, okay? So I think, yes, it's possible to, to start something with friends if you trust them and if you've worked with them before. Uh, from, from the readings that, I, that I've had, they said that the most successful startups are not with specifically friends, like personal friends, but more with colleagues or ex-co-workers, people who you've actually worked with before, okay? So not just because you grew up together, let's say, on the same street or something like that, but because you've actually worked together and sat together in an office, had a product together, then you've seen uh, that side of the other person. You've seen how they deal with business. You've seen, you know, when things don't go right, what happens, and you know, the attitudes and all that. So that's usually the, the most successful formula is to try to work with people who you've already had a working relationship with before, 
and not you know, a family relationship or anything that's too close that you can risk you know, um, losing that. And uh, what resources did you use to scale your startups? Is there any resource specific to do why? Um, resource, can you explain? Resources, resources for example, people. such as your connections, going to networking events, uh, having colleagues. Yes, okay. So as I mentioned before, networking is probably one of the single most important things that I've found, especially in this region, in this part of the world, is that you just have to constantly be networking. So one of the strategies that I use is that I try to add at least 10 new people on, on LinkedIn every day. And I introduce myself, of course, I don't just add randomly. But, um, and I, I look at their profiles and we have something in common. So it's not a random process, I mean, it has to be a very meticulous process. Who do you approach and who do you speak to? Which positions of people do you want to approach? Um, that's one thing. Another thing, you mentioned the uh, events and activities. That's also a very important thing. I, I think I've made about half of my network through rigorously attending a lot of the events that happen around here. Throughout the last two years, I think I've been to every single uh, hackathon. That's how I mentioned it, because you're every mentioned. single event. Exactly. And you were almost the same, so that's great. So that's how you make connections. You know, it's you just have to be there. and you show When you show up a lot, people say, oh, I've seen you before. You must be interested in, in this uh, Ecosystem, you know, let's talk and that kind of thing, right? Then you keep seeing people over and over again. Um, that's how the connections are formed. So I think, yes, people are your greatest resource, and I think you should focus on making meaningful, strong, solid, targeted connections with the right people at the right time in order to leverage the connections to, to help your growth. Uh, what has been the hardest day for you in your company? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think there's a lot to think on. Um, many hard days. It's not just one hard day. I guess. Um, one that just comes to my mind right now. I mean, as I said, there's been many things, of course, that happened throughout the course of this, and it's it's definitely not not an easy process at all getting into business. But um, one rough day, particularly, was when uh, the uh, recruit the Dubai Job Connections, you know, the recruitment platform, uh, got attacked by hackers, and. Uh, they almost destroyed half of the database that we have, and they took down a lot of the features. I don't know why it happened, it was totally random. We never knew who, who did it. Uh, we just saw all this jumbled up data and all that. And it took us about two to three weeks to just be able to understand how, how to fix things and how to bring things back online. And of course it meant, for, especially for a new brand, you don't want your, your page to be down for, for a long time and show people that you're not a capable company or a capable brand. It can damage you as a small business more than it damages a bigger company. A bigger company already has a name, right? So for a company like us, being seen, you know, uh, off the off the market for two to three weeks, that was a really pretty big thing. We had a lot of calls, a lot of questions, a lot of this and that. And, you know, the site's not working. I've tried it. You know. So even after it came back online, it took a while for all the features to work. People were, you know, getting uh, error messages and all that kind of stuff. So yes, there 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 will be there will be a lot of hard things. So can you just tell us about the one failure when you just thought, I'm just giving up on all these startups, I'm going back to corporate, or just any day, we just want to just give up. Can you give us a specific example of that hard day? Uh, let me think. Uh, I think for Startup Central, actually, we, we have faced some setbacks where we were, where me and my team had that feeling. Uh, we felt, because really, Startup Central, it's as you mentioned, it's a not-for-profit. We didn't intend to put this in the market and spend a lot of money on it and get money back in return. That's not how it works. It's not for profit, and it should be something that the community takes and grows themselves, right? It should be self-sustaining from the community and for the community. And we run into a lot of setbacks where it seems that you know some key people are not really you know finding it interesting or valuable or that kind of thing in the in the, in the beginning, back in the early days. Um, and we've already invested our own money into it and our own effort into building it and putting it out for the community. We, I mean, the least we would have expected is the community to say, oh, well, thanks, this is a nice gift for us, and we'll, we'll take it from here. <laughs> but life isn't that easy, of course. So, um, yeah, there, there were a lot of moments where we felt, okay, well, either one, one of us or, or all of us have to go back into corporate jobs to just be able to generate money to spend more on the platform and to grow it ourselves, or, you know, we just leave it and we give up on it or something like that, right? So yes, of course, I have these thoughts. <laughs> so one of the reasons people don't want to start up in Dubai is because it's not easy. Because for example, rent is really expensive. You can't really find a cheap place to stay. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the rules that's in the whole Gulf region. Yeah. 
do you have any solution uh, to this problem so that Dubai and other Gulf countries can become international hubs for people to really consider uh, launching a startup in this region? All right. Well, there are, I guess, multiple ways to kind of get around this, and we've, we've talked separately outside of on this before. Um, the part about Dubai being expensive, there, there's no easy solution for this. It's gonna be, this is the cost of living, and it's a, it's a matter of supply and demand. And I don't think any single person can say, let's drop the cost of living by half, right? So that's not gonna go away. So I think the other alternative would be that um, startups have to be able to get access to investment early on, okay? And that's one of the things that's a little bit still lacking here now, is that, uh, I mean, there are some investors and there are some uh, uh, you know, VCs and all that, but they're not, it's not a very organized market for investment. And the investments don't like to go in very early. They're, they're a bit more risk averse in this region than they are in the US. So in the US, for example, if somebody comes up with a new idea in Silicon Valley, within weeks, they could get an investment for like a million dollars or something, right? And it's high, I, I know some stories you know, where that's happened. But here, I think investors prefer to be <coughs> much more cautious, maybe a bit more cautious than necessary, where they wait until the startup reaches its second, third, or fourth kind of growth stage, and then the investor says, okay, now I'm interested, right? And during that period, it's the uh, entrepreneurs who have to bootstrap and put their own money into the, the project the whole time, and it drains them, and really, and as you said, it brings them to the brink of, uh, of quitting it or anything like that, because at the end of the day, it's a practical matter. You know, If you don't have the money to spend and to sustain yourself, you can't. You, know, you just can't you know, invent it. So um, I think one of the viable solutions would be that investors get a bit more organized and have more access to the deal flow coming from, from the startups, picking the right startups, and taking a bit more risk in investing in the right startups early on. And in that case, they carry the burden a bit off the, the entrepreneur, and they alleviate this kind of concern, they let the entrepreneur uh, free their mind to think more about the, what they're doing, or about the, uh, the project itself, than thinking, oh, how am I, how am I gonna survive for another month, right? So that's one thing I would uh, suggest. Uh, one of the issues I had when pitching for investors is that you should invest to say, you know, your market is not big enough. You know, compared to San Francisco, when Uber wanted to start, had a big market to test their idea. Do you maybe think there should be like a program, for example, where people who have great ideas can actually go and test it on a bigger market? Because see, the market is too small. Do you actually think maybe there should become a, a program so that entrepreneurs can go to the US and test on their idea and then come back to Dubai with that experience? Do you think that's maybe a possible solution to, to that? Sure. I'll give you kind of two, two answers for that because on the one hand, yes, there are programs that are doing what you've mentioned. There are some programs that kind of create a bridge between Silicon Valley and, and this region. And they do take some entrepreneurs over there to test their ideas and then some, I mean, there's kind of like a switching or a exchange program between entrepreneurs and all that. That does happen. So if someone is interested in that, that there, the, these uh, facilities are there. Uh, again, for certain ideas and certain types of entrepreneurs, you have to be selected, I guess. You have to win a competition or something. And I know one, um, uh, group from here in Dubai, you know Alan Health, right? Yes. yes, so they won one of the hackathons here, and then they were taken to, to Silicon Valley now for a month or two, uh, some kind of a, a period of exchange, okay? So that does happen, but on the other hand, what I want to say is that you don't have to rely on, on this to happen or wait for this to happen, because you can, now with the technology that we have, you can enter a global market from here, right? So you don't need to be physically located in Silicon Valley to have access to the US market, for example, or the European market or any of that. You can actually, from here, and I've, I've done that with some of my own projects, one of, one of the apps that I look after, for example, the app is not uh, necessarily tied to this region. It, it can be used by anyone in the world. So basically, we, we uh, ran social media ads in different parts of the world to see which country would take off the most. And there were, of course, countries that you know, liked the idea more than others, so then that's the country that you decide to focus on, for example, and you can grow it. So it's an app, it's accessible from anywhere, you can download it from your phone, the person doesn't have to be sitting here in Dubai to download it, right? And you don't have to be sitting there to advertise it there. Yes. So for t with today's technology, um, it really doesn't matter where you're physically located. As long as you have some cultural awareness and knowledge of other uh, regions of the world, and maybe you're willing to contact people over there to be your freelancers or something like that, you can make sales any place. Okay. Uh, so most people that talk about Silicon Valley, so they're talking about startups, um, do you think we should also look into the Asian market, for example, Hong Kong, Singapore, all these high-tech cities? I think a lot of us are focusing on getting into Silicon Valley. Do you think we should also focus getting into 
these uh, Asian countries? Okay, I think there are a lot of. Uh, I mean, there are a lot. The fact is, there are a lot of um, startup hubs around the world. Sorry, some maybe bigger than others. So uh, in Asia, yes, you have Singapore. You mentioned a, a couple. In Europe, you have you have London. You have, for example, Berlin. You have some parts of Eastern Europe. So the, the hubs exist. But the reason why people are attracted more to Silicon Valley is because most of the success, the big success stories come out of there. Yes. And the reason for that, I think, is because most of the money is there, right? So an entrepreneur ultimately wants to find the biggest um, access to capital that they can, right? So if they have a choice between all the cities in the world, they might ask, okay, which is the city where I'm more likely to get money for my project, okay? So if Singapore or one of these other places has shown that they invest in a lot of uh, projects and the projects grow and succeed, then entrepreneurs will go will start going there more. But currently, the way things are, that seems to happen more in Silicon Valley uh, because there's the biggest concentration of investors and also the biggest concentration of news agencies and media networks that are focused on startups. So if you have a startup coming out of there, they will publicize it for you. Everybody reads TechCrunch. Everybody reads uh, you know these famous Mashable and like uh, Wired magazine and all that. And these are all shining the spotlight on Silicon Valley. So unfortunately, it is a bit kind of lopsided in, in that direction, but I think the competition from other parts of the world will will, will grow to, the, to that level eventually. Uh, in your opinion, why do startups fail? Can you give just two or three? Two or three examples. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess we've mentioned already some uh, before in our talk. So one is probably not having the right people or the right team. Okay. The other one would be not having access to capital at the right moment, because again, capital has to come at the right moment. It has, can't be too late or even too soon, right? Uh, another reason would be not, uh, I mean, ineffective strategy of taking the, the idea to the market. So usually a lot of startups, uh, from what I see in my network, at Startup Central, for example, a lot of the startups that come complaining, they come complaining about sales, business development, taking things to the market and selling them. And usually that's where the disconnect is. And as a startup, you don't have access to the big advertising resources that the large companies have. You can't just put a a banner on the Shake's Eye Road, for example, right? Um, so the big companies will always be able to do that, and you won't. Uh, so, but you have to have an alternate strategy where you can do guerrilla marketing or kind of tactical marketing to get the word out there in the cheapest way or most cost-efficient way possible. So these are usually the, the main reasons why startups uh, don't make it. So you're also an investor, right? Mm -hmm. Can you give us can you give us three things investors look at when uh, when choosing a startup to invest in? Okay. Um, well, again, I'll try to give some two different answers for that. Okay. One is my own strategy for investment. One is what I've seen other investors do here. So what I've seen other investors do is they, they seem to focus a bit more on the traditional business models that are kind of tried and tested. They're a bit skeptical or a bit cautious from radical new ideas. Okay. So most of the companies that got invested here are, for example, okay, we, we can mention Kareem, obviously. Kareem had a huge uh, investment, and because Kareem is operating in a market that's already tried and tested, right? Uber is succeeding, and uh, some other companies are doing the same and succeeding. So when Kareem came out, it wasn't a, a you know a revolutionary new idea. People saw that this is already succeeding, and they invested in it. Same thing happened with uh, perhaps Fetcher or like you know delivery company or things like that. So these models are already tested throughout the world. You know there have been delivery companies before. You know there's nothing new about that. You're not inventing a new market. So investors are more confident to invent. In Invest in that. Uh, but if you come up with a completely new idea that's never been done before, they're a bit more cautious. They want to see how the traction goes. Now, from my own view, um, I usually like to pick, again, this is my own view. I'm not saying this is something that's recommended everyone to, to follow, but this is just, you know, maybe I take the easy way or something. I don't know. So um, I like to focus more on B2C businesses because I think they're easier to take to the market. B2B means you have to have a team of people doing business development, cold calling, calling the companies and getting co corporate accounts, right? B2C is a bit easier nowadays because it's more social media and more like, you can disseminate the information easier, right? Uh, another thing is also, uh, I like to focus on projects that cannot be replicated uh, by Silicon Valley. Because Silicon Valley is always that big cloud, you know, you know scaring us you know, over there. So if you create an idea where it's something that easily if somebody sees, this, somebody sees it from Silicon Valley, they can say, let's do the same thing. They'll kill you, they'll, they'll, they'll take you out of the market because they have more resources and more, you know. So what I mean by ideas like that is, for example, things that are com completely customized to this region, 
that Silicon Valley wouldn't even know how to copy it because it's so racially focused. It's made for this market and it uses cultural knowledge of this market that nobody else can, can copy, right? So things like that I usually think are more safer investment because you don't have that fear of you know, a bigger a bigger competitor moving in and, and taking it out. Uh, so what is the unique opportunity or obstacle that startups face in Dubai or in the MENA region? Unique obstacles. Okay, well I think in the MENA region obviously the, one of the biggest obstacles is the constant kind of instabilities, you know, geopolitical instabilities that are going around other parts of the region. Thankfully not in this country nor in the rest of the GCC, but in other parts of the region there are some instabilities and that causes a bit of uh, caution on the investment, uh, on the investors part on how much money they want to actually risk or invest in the region, right? Uh, another thing is also, um, I think in, in let's, let's, let's make it a bit more specific to the, to the GCC actually now. Here, the labor market is structured a bit differently. Like for example, if you're running a startup, let's say in the US, you'd be able to have an endless supply of volunteers, interns, students, that kind of thing, you know, to help, and, and that's usually the type of labor that startups rely on, because that's the, the lower lower cost uh, labor, and you get a lot of younger people who are interested in, in uh, working for a startup and, and getting that learning. Here, that is a difficulty in some in some parts of, of this region, where, for example, most of the people who are living here, they need a visa to live here, for example, or they're not from from the country. Uh, you don't have a lot of uh, homegrown families that, that have uh, you know uh, their children could be volunteers or interns with them like that. People usually come here in a working age already. So that's, that, that's another bit of an issue that I've, uh, I've seen, where you know hiring for a startup, you either have to hire someone with a full salary and, and a you know, visa structure and all that, otherwise you don't get any, any, uh, any simple resources like these. You know. So these are a couple of issues that, that, uh, that I think are obstacles here. And uh, what obstacles do you foresee for entrepreneurs in the MENA region within five to ten years? <laughs> it's hard to forecast the future, but I think uh, I like to be optimistic, honestly, about the future. So I would like to say that in five to ten years, things would be a lot better than they are now, and investors would have taken more taken more notice to this region and, and brought more money here and brought themselves here and been able to trust the products of this region, uh, you know, and the success stories coming out of this region. Because now we have a few success stories already. Five years ago, that didn't exist. You know, if you came and said, "Let's invest in a startup in the, in, in the GCC." What would be a success story? At that time, I think there was only one, which is uh, Maktoub, which was purchased by Yahoo. But now, you can name five or six or 10 startups that have done very well. Talabat.com, which was acquired, Dubizel, which was acquired, Kobon, Karim, uh, you know, and all these other ones, where they have done well, they've attracted invest uh, investment. Some of them have exited or sold, you know, and, and, and got their money back and got some return. So I think, hopefully in the next five years, if this trend continues, then things will be twice as good as they are now. A lot of investors will say, yes, this region is great. These people have good minds. These people have good ideas. <coughs> let's come here and let's invest here, right? And you know, let's let's help the ecosystem to grow. So that's what I would hope in the next five years. Uh, what's your current uh, opinion? What's your opinion of the current tech landscape in Dubai with regards to startups, the startup ideas here? Do you feel that most of the ideas here are just replicates of what's happening in Silicon Valley? Or do you find this ideas original, what's already there in the market? There's a mix. I mean, uh, there's a mix of both. And I don't think there's anything wrong with the replication part, as long as it's made in a customized way. Uh, like, uh, I'm, uh, I used my example that I just mentioned again, Kareem. So uh, Kareem didn't just copy what was on the market. They, they customized the solution for certain particular issues that are happening in this region. For example, they offer cash payments versus credit card, because not everybody has a credit card here and all that. And they do uh, advanced bookings and some other features. Um, so yes, I mean, there's no, there's nothing wrong with taking an idea that's working outside and bringing it here with a regional, you know, with a regional set of features, a regional mix, a regional focus. Uh, there are also some new ideas that I've, I've seen come out of here. Um, but again, the new ideas, these are kind of where it gets scary, right? Is where if you're generating a completely new idea and you want to compete globally, you just have to keep in mind. You know, Silicon Valley is at the other end. If you can do it, they can probably do it too. Unless you do something that's so customized for the culture and the region that you're in that nobody would know how to copy, right? So both both uh, types of entry are a bit risky. You know, if you're if you're doing a, repli a replication or something like that, you have to be cautious that you 
you differentiate it enough, and you do it in the right way. If you're doing a new idea, it's also a risk, right? Is the new idea going to work? Are people going to take it or not? So both ways are equally risky, and, and you know, entrepreneurs just have to choose the right path where they think um, they're passionate about. And uh, what do you think about incubators, accelerators, uh, and uh, VCs, angel investors? Mm -hmm. Do you think there are enough of accelerators in, in Dubai or the Indian region? Do you think there's place for more? Okay. Um, I think having accelerators and incubators in this region is very, very valuable. I think they bring a valuable resource to the ecosystem where they assist, mentor, incubate, invest, and help the startups to, to, to grow. And I think any healthy ecosystem around the world has a good system of, uh, a good network of incubators in it. So I think there's definitely value in that. Whether the number of, of them are, are enough or not, that's not really an argument you can make because, I mean, they can always expand, you know, so it's not like having five small incubators or, or 15 big ones or, I mean, that's, the, the argument of number is not really the case. I think it's the issue more of awareness. How, how much are people aware of the existence of these incubators and aware that they can go and, and try to enter one of the incubators and, and, and use the, the services that they have? So I have a lot of startups that come to, to me or that, you know, that come to us on the platform where they say, okay, we have this idea and now we, we don't know how to get it off the ground. I'm like, well, have you considered joining one of the incubators? And they haven't thought of it or maybe they're not aware of all the incubators that exist. I think right now there are about six or seven here in the UAE. Um, so if, I think if, if we can get more awareness towards these incubators, and that's one of the things we try to do also on Startup Central. We try to partner with each incubator, list them on our platform as a partner, and then when entrepreneurs come, they'll have the choice. So they can say, oh, so these are all the incubators that are here, and this is the different program types that they offer, and these are the different criteria and the different joining dates and all that kind of thing. It's like when you're a student looking for university. So then they can choose the right one for them and say, okay, I, my product is like, half technology, half whatever, I think it's a perfect fit for this particular incubator. They go and approach it and they apply there and then hopefully they get it. So I think, yeah, it's, it's more of a matter of um, the incubators covering the pool of entrepreneurs very well and making sure that everyone who needs access to an incubator can at least, you know, be considered. Of course, they can't admit everyone, but at least they, you know, everyone can, can be considered and go through the application process and see, you know, if they make or not. And can you give us pieces of advice with regards to attaining partnerships, press, and customers, because I think you're really good at that. Okay. Um, well, I wouldn't say I'm really good at that, but I'm trying to. Um, press is a, is a tough one to crack, for example. We've been trying to, you know, get a lot of uh, connections with the press and all that. They're hard to get a hold of. They're, they don't run, like, every story that they get uh, their hands on. Um, there's a lot of competition for press, and there's a lot of noise, and other things going on with the press. So that's always been a difficult one. Um, getting customers, again, that's, uh, that's that's where every startup struggles, isn't it? So it depends on who your customer is. I mean, there's no one strategy, of course, that can fit every the type of startup, but um, you just have to find out where your customers are and you reach them there. You know, if, they, if they're the type where you, you think they're always on social media or they're always in a certain kind of physical location or anything like that, you just have to be able to reach them and really engage their hearts and minds with good content, you know, good uh, stories, good services, good, you know, that kind of thing. So it's all about the awareness and engagement of the customer. Um, and I think you previously you mentioned about VCs. So that's one of the points where, again, I think there's probably not enough uh, VC groups or angel investor groups here. Um, and if there are some, we're not aware of all of them because it's, I guess it's a bit of a disorganized market. So there's no website where you can open and say, okay, here's a list of all the investors that are here. Which one do you want to talk to, right? And in the in the U.S. and Silicon Valley, there are a couple of websites. There's one called AngelList, and there's uh, F6S and a couple of things like that. They do work here as well, of course, these websites, but they're not fully used by by the network here. So that again, that's one of the things where Startup Central and other similar platform, for example, one of our one of our partner plat platforms is uh, Magnet, and they try to also organize the investor market here. So hopefully, between all of us bring a bit more order to the investor market where if somebody actually wants to speak to a particular investor based on the investor's interests, right? Let's say if this investor wants to do only healthcare or <coughs> education startups or all that. So if you if you fall into that category, you know you know who to contact, you know? That doesn't exist uh, so easily right now and hopefully hopefully soon it will. Okay, so one issue all startup founders face mm -hmm. is balancing family and business. <coughs> How do you do that? Can you give us advice? <laughs> it's always going to be difficult, um, especially if you're 
if you're on a tight budget, it's going to be especially difficult because that means you, you're going to have to do most of the work yourself. If you have a bigger budget, for example, if you have some investment money or family money or anything, you can hire people to do some of the work for you, obviously. You can hire freelancers even. It doesn't have to be an expensive hire. You can go online and hire a freelancer somewhere to do some of the stuff for you. So that can spare you some of the sleepless nights coding or you know, doing things, writing things or all that. Uh, if you can get outside help, of course, that definitely helps you know, keep you balanced. Um, but if you're in a stage where, at least in the initial stage, I think when you're really trying to get your product out of the box, you will probably uh, sacrifice a bit of your social life for a few weeks. But it's, hopefully it's well worth it. If you're working on a, a project that you're really passionate about and you really believe in, then you should invest your time in it. There's nothing wrong in that. And your friends and, 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 and family will understand that you're kind of disappearing for a bit. But hopefully within a few weeks, you know, that, that phase should be over. After that, if you're able to attract investment or get some uh, uh, capital from, from any source, hopefully that will alleviate some of the work on you personally. Uh, so looking back at your entrepreneurship do you have any regrets? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know it's a difficult question. That's a difficult question because there are probably a few. Mm, let me try to think here for a minute. Um, well, I guess on the balance of things, there are some of, some of the projects that I'm managing, I should have probably focused on more, uh, on some of them uh, rather than others. Um, you know, I chased a few projects that kind of were dead end. I didn't know that, of course, at the time. Um, another thing, as you mentioned, is about the cost of living. So obviously, if I was able to place myself in somewhere where the cost of living was a bit lower, you know, I would have obviously had more money to spare right now to, to be able to invest further in, in more projects and things like that. So right now, I'm kind of at, I already reached the capacity of the projects that I'm able to take. Uh, I would have hoped to be able to do more. But again, the cost of living is also another thing that you kind of struggle with, and there's no way around it. You know? So that's one thing. Um, Anything else regretting? Yeah, I think I, I, another thing I would do if I would start this over, I would make my connections earlier. So I think I, I realized this a bit late in the game that I have to network more and build all these connections and all that. I should have done this from the very first month. You know, if I knew in the first month of, of you know my startups the amount of people that I knew now, things would have been a lot of, a lot different. So it took me time to realize that okay, you have to meet all these people, you have to make these connections, you have to build these relationships, and that's what's going to help you. So yeah, see, these are some of the things that I hope you know uh, new entrepreneurs would would, would uh, consider. Uh, so you call do you call your entrepreneurship journey basically a practical MBA. So can you give us any uh, lessons, like two or three lessons from your uh, practical MBA journey? No. Oh, gosh. you would learn a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you will definitely learn a lot. I mean, it's. Um, legal matters, financial matters, like all kinds of stuff that you don't, there's things that you don't just, um, uh, even, if it, even if you do take a class on them in school, the class doesn't come as detailed or as practical as, as you would learn in, in, in this case. Um, so for example, how, how do you do PR? You know, how do you, you know, chase up relationships with journalists, for example? Nobody will ever teach you that, right? But now we have to learn that the hard way. Um, what are the situations where you can negotiate a certain contract and, and you know uh, have a have a, li a a good chance of getting what you want and not getting rejected out of it? Um, what else? Uh, how to measure your finances very very carefully, you know, and, and and plan for not just the worst case scenario, but even worse than the worst case scenario. Because some of some of the things that I got into, the the outcome was actually a lot below what the worst case scenario was in the, in the initial forecast. So these things. I said, it's really hard to quantify. It's just these are hard lessons that every entrepreneur, I think, will learn. And that it's hard to, to get any, any other way, except if you actually put your hands into it, and then you'll, you'll learn it the hard way. That's the, <laughs> that's the gist of it. Okay, so to conclude this uh, startup grind fireside chat, uh, can you give us one or two takeaway points okay. with regards to starting up? Sure. So I guess the biggest takeaway point, especially given the subject of this discussion today, is that as an ecosystem, we all have to come together. Okay, I think that's that, that's going to be one of the biggest solutions to our, our issues. So all the issues that I think we mentioned today, that could be a solution for them, because that means that the investors will be available. Um, you know, founders will be able to find each other and connect with each other. The networking that I described, which is a difficult process, networking with people, that will be a bit easier. So I think if we all come together and kind of, it, it requires a bit of you know sacrificing your 
individuality, competitiveness, and all that to become part of a community, right? You have a sense of community that we actually care about this community and the future of the community. What's going to happen here after 10, 15, 20 years? So now we are the generation that's building this, right? So I think we should all come together and forget our differences and like different styles and all that, and just all connect to help each other to grow. That's that's the one way where the ecosystem will grow. That's what's happening in Silicon Valley, by the way, right? A lot of people there are doing this. 20-year visions and 30-year visions and thinking, and they actually care about what happens, you know, that long down the road. And they're planting the seeds now for the things that happen uh, then at that time, right? So again, um, uh, not to uh, keep reiterating Startup Central as a, as a platform, but that this is hopefully one of the platforms that can bring everyone together. So whether it's this platform or something else or another solution that, that, that comes along, I hope we all get connected. So that's the biggest. Okay, we're now starting our Q&A session. I think you had a question. Yeah, um, you mentioned a lot about the connections. How can we improve our connections? How can we improve our connections? Uh, okay. Well, as I mean, uh, maybe you walked in maybe a little uh, later when I spoke about, um, uh, I do, for example, some practices where I try to connect with, with yeah, with uh, LinkedIn, all that thing, so you heard that. And then also events, okay? So by attending all these events and functions and all that, I, I try to help, help stay connected. Like, as you mentioned before, like, we as startups have, like, we need connecting with business and young people. So how can we improve? Yeah, we need to target them through there. Like, for example, on LinkedIn, sometimes I would search for a specific type of business, a category of business. I find out who is the you know, managing director or you know one of the senior people in that business, and I'll connect with them directly. I'll try to ask them to have a coffee meeting or a kind of an introduction. So, social using social media now, mm -hmm. you can actually search for any type of business, category, person, level, function, anything like that, and you can kind of zero in and identify the type of person you want to connect with. And either you sometimes they they, they might not be you know be willing to connect with you just randomly on LinkedIn. So well, another way you can do it is you find out if that person is going to be speaking somewhere or attending a conference or something, and you just have to go there and, and, and try to catch them. So a lot of manual work is required in that. There's a, um, a famous book called uh, Never Eat Alone, about people how, how people network, and how you can use all of your lunches, coffee time, whatever, all that to meet a new person all the time. And the person who wrote the book, uh, Keith Ferrazzi, described his own experience that sometimes he would go to a conference where he wants to meet one of the speakers, and he'd wait behind the stage, and, and the guy comes, and then he gives him his card or something like that. So a lot of that is needed as well. You just need to, you know, hustle kind of thing. <laughs> okay. The next question. Yes. Let's say that you were that you were starting a business that was not very unique, like for example, real estate brokerage. How would you differentiate yourself from other like companies? There's always a way to differentiate. So either you differentiate on the, let's say the service, level of service that you offer. Either you differentiate on your pricing strategy, you can differentiate on the business model that you have. You can have, for example, have it in a different way or a reverse way from what the market is doing, okay? Um, you can differentiate from the branding, the look and feel, the you know attractiveness of the branding. You can differentiate on the content that you create on it and the stories, the videos, the animations, all the things that you put into it. So there, there is always a way to differentiate. And there's always a newcomer that will come in an existing market and do something a little bit better. For example, when the iPhone was released, there was millions of phones already out, you know, but the iPhone was able to differentiate. They created a, you know, a level of quality and level of service and, and features that, you know, that didn't exist before. So things like that. I mean, you, you should always, um, uh, I mean, don't shy away from, a, from, a, from a, an existing market. Just think of how you can differentiate on maybe one or two things. Oh, sorry. Please, please go ahead. From an advertisement perspective, is using social media um, for advertising a good idea? Because I know, like, from personal experience, when you log into Facebook, say, you're just bombarded with so many ads that you don't even pay attention to them. Okay. So is using social media an effective strategy? Okay. Honestly, from my own experience, I, uh, I tend to agree with you. I think that uh, <coughs> social media for direct advertising is not very effective. What it is effective in it is um, generating awareness. Okay. So some people, even though they don't click on the ad on the side of the page on, on Facebook, but at least they'll see it. They'll see the brand. They'll see the name, right? So uh, you know. So at least it creates some imprint in their in their mind, some awareness. And then when you 
when they see your name in another place, then at least they'll make that association. So for example, another place you can advertise would be, let's say Google AdWords, where if you do a search ad, you, you would actually catch the customer while they're actually searching for that particular thing. So that means that thing is already on their mind and they're searching for it and your, your solution comes up. So then they would know, oh, I've seen this on Facebook before, or something like that. So you actually have to do a multiple approach for advertising. Some of it may, maybe requires outdoor promoters handing out cards or something like that or anything, but when they see it coming from multiple channels, it becomes a bit more trustworthy. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned uh, founding founders is like dating or getting married. Uh, exactly. But my question is that there are a lot of ways you can find founders now. You have, you have them online. You have all these events. But to actually get to know their values and how they think actually takes a lot of time. Do you have any other solutions how to solve that problem, or is it just spend as much time as as you can? I think, yes, yeah, spending time helps, but I think also to accelerate the process a bit, you can suggest to work with that person on something. Maybe something that actually isn't very significant or isn't very important. You can actually take a risk on working with this person. So that would be the test project, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so during that project, you'll be able to see the character of that person, how's their work ethic, and how's their you know, work abilities, or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also look at their own track record. So you can kind of have an in-depth conversation with the person and ask, you know, how, what kind of projects they worked with in the past in their own company or something like that, how did they handle it and all that. So to get to know a bit more about the person's career, you know, what they've achieved in their career, their, their record and history of, of, of achievements and things like that, uh, how do they handle things when they fail. So yeah, I mean, you can, you can have kind of a deep conversations and discussions with the person to accelerate the process a little bit. So instead of waiting for six months to, to learn about the person, you can maybe do it in a few weeks. Yes? Is there any specific uh, entrepreneur Um, okay. Well, <laughs> not sure if we we're, we're, we're going to be naming names here or anything, but let me try to think of any, uh, let's say, companies that came out or became aspiration. Um, I mean, I think I've mentioned a few already, that some of the companies here that succeeded. Obviously, I'll, some of the entrepreneurs, I know them personally. Some of them I don't, but I know their achievements. So I know what, what companies they, they uh, built and how those companies succeeded. And at the end of the day, Success is one of the only measurements we have to measure if uh, you know if something did well or not, because a company might be run very well internally and you know uh, you know managed in a very nice way and all that, but if it hasn't succeeded commercially in the market, we won't hear about it. So the stories of success that I just mentioned here, you know, a few minutes ago, I think these are the ones that everybody has not now seen as a testament to you know entrepreneurs who had the right passion and who were able to create the right value in their company to attract investment. Okay. There might be other entrepreneurs who are doing great things out there that maybe I haven't heard of yet or you haven't heard of yet because they're not in the news yet or they, we, don't, we haven't heard of them yet. Um, I meet a lot of entrepreneurs personally, but again, a lot of people are still in their early stages, so it's hard to, to tell you know, uh, which of them are going where. So I guess time will tell you know, which entrepreneurs will, will shine more than others. And um, uh, we try to take the learnings from the one who do succeed. Okay. And I think the ones who have succeeded, they actually try to give back the knowledge as well. So I know, for example, the founders from Kareem, they try to work with entrepreneurs and mentor them and give some of this, you know, success advice that they've had. Yeah. The last question. Oh. Well, sorry, you're you you're welcome. Sorry. Uh, no, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, I want to just ask you about the startup country. I understand that you're uh, part of the board of the startup country. Yeah. So, what are the practical solutions, or how can you help uh, startup businesses and uh, new entrepreneurs? And what are the tools that you have in place for that? Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we, the main tool that we have is the offering the connection between people. So, for example, we do sometimes we even we, we step into the platform and we, we do kind of founder <coughs> matchmaking, right? So we <coughs> always try to speak to everyone who's on the platform and ask what are you interested in and what stage are you working. And if we find two answers that match, we will introduce you to each other. We'll say, okay, well that person's also working on something similar. Would you guys like to join together, for example? Uh, another way is we try to connect uh, entrepreneurs with mentors, with advisors, with investors. So currently right now we have actually a good number of mentors. So if any entrepreneur wants to be connected with a, with a, a practical mentor, someone who's actually done the same thing before, we, we're, we can make that connection. Investors as well, we're trying to build our, our investor uh, 
network right now. So if you go to the page of Startup Central, you'll see that we already have two or three platforms that we partnered with. So we have uh, Magnet, which is a network of investors. We have Investors with an E, uh, Investors Mina, which is an angel network. And we have also uh, Eureka, Eureka, which is a crowd investment platform. So through these connections, we can help um, entrepreneurs find you know, that. Uh, another thing is also on our forums, we have a lot of useful information that entrepreneurs can use. So we have a forum about, uh, for example, legal tips and advice. We have a business formation and set up and you know, free zones and all that kind of stuff. And we have also a, a section where all the service providers are, are providing their services. So we have, for example, people who do financial services, legal services, marketing, branding, technical, all that. So if you're looking to connect with one of those people, you might find uh, resources there. Thanks. One on the last one. And, and for um, a startup in the region, the UAE or GCC, um, you, like I've heard from people that uh, like a local investor or local connection is very, very beneficial. Do you agree with that, or do you think the necessity or sorry for what type of business? Any, any any type of startup mm -hmm. is like having a local connection or a local investor is it a necessity or is it local meaning someone who is a citizen of this country yeah, or just living like, uh, like yeah yeah. Of someone that's based in the country. Okay. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. It depends on the type of business. If it's a business that requires really entering the physical local market, like if you're, for example, if you're doing something that will involve, let's say, um, I mean, something that happens physically on the ground, you know, and you can benefit from the knowledge of a local partner who knows the way of the land, knows the culture of the people, and knows all that, then yes. But if you have a type of business, that is really equally applicable anywhere in the world, okay? Um, then probably not. Like for example, that's why I think the UAE, uh, in its wisdom, has set up the free zone system, where free zone uh, means that anyone um, from from another country can can uh, start a business in a free zone without having a local partner. It's because if the business is global or wants to be kind of global, and it doesn't require specific local knowledge, then yeah, it can be done that way. You know? Does that answer the okay? Now we're going to the announcements. Our Global Startup Mind uh, Conference in Silicon Valley is uh, less than two weeks away. I hope to see uh, some of your faces there in Silicon Valley. Uh, on the 28th of Feb in Dubai, we have Tariq Qureshi from 100% Mad. On March 14th, we have Fida Shaban, editor in chef of uh, Chief of Entrepreneur Middle East. April 12th, we have Amira Rashad, head of brand at Facebook. May 10th, we have Sahar from on uh, July 19th, we have Haider Khan from Dubai. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon.